popping in to say you are live and ready to go. Or you are muted. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday Tea with Touchstone. Um, so happy that you're here. My name is Mara Tesler Stein, and I'm the founder and director of the Touchstone Institute. And I am so happy to be able to welcome here today, Suna Klinchard, um, to talk about integrating EMDR into your clinical practice, um, particularly for new EMDR therapists, but really I think all of us can benefit from what Suna has to say. So I'm gonna take just a moment to let you know um, about Suna. Um, Suna is um, an EMDRIA approved consultant and a member of the Touchstone Institute training team. She is, um, incredibly experienced and talented, passionate clinician. Um, she's been a facilitator for us, for our foundational trainings for a number of years now, um, and offers really um, expert consultation to consultees both who are new to EMDR and also more experienced clinicians, and is a perinatal mental health specialist, um, and has been just a gift uh, on our team. So I'm just thrilled, Suna, to have you here and can't wait to hear what you have to say. So welcome. Thank you so much, Mara, for your kind words. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit of information with you today um, that stems from questions I've heard throughout the past several years in consultation. So I often work with newly trained EMDR therapists who are really just wondering how to begin, right? So I've completed the training, maybe um, they've even completed parts one and parts and parts part one and two of the training and um, are still just really struggling with knowing how to weave this new lens and this EMDR practice into their therapy practice. So I've put together a few tips that I hope you'll find helpful. Let's see. Give me just a second to pull up my screen. I thought it was right there. Give me just a second. Sorry about that. And Ah, let's see. So I just well versed with it. We're just uh, given the lowdown on how the tech works and it looks like I'm struggling. Give me just a second. I'm here. popping in to assist, Suna. So Thank you. Have you. To hit that, that little <laughs> present button in the back of Zoom, you all right? Yeah. Okay. An inside uh, view of the back side of these trainings. Um, so you'll have to click the So course. the present and share screen. And somehow it's not coming up there as an option for me to choose. So maybe it's. Hmm. You've got your slide deck open on your computer. I do have the slide deck open. Let's try one more time. Cancel. Okay. You might have to get out of presentation mode in um, PowerPoint. That mm -hmm. might help. OK. And then when you click present share screen, hopefully it lets you choose that application. Present share screen. Um, it's not popping up. Oh, no. Okay, sorry. So I'm just wondering what happened. It worked a second ago when we tried it. Um, do you have any other thoughts? Um, I was going to say, otherwise, Suna, if you want to send it to one of us, I could, like, if you want to email it to me, I can pop it up. Sure. 
Sorry for the delay, everyone. We'll be right with you. <laughs> Mara, do you want to maybe introduce a little bit about Tuesday Teas in general while Suna is getting her slides organized? I, ah, there we are. Okay. Um, so in the meantime, as we're getting slides all settled, let me tell you a little bit about what Tuesday Tea is meant to be and why we're doing this. Um, we here at the Touchstone Institute have been hard at work, as you know, building out um, multi-day trainings, you know, really in-depth looks at a lot of the intersections of perinatal mental health and trauma-focused treatment. And we really wanted to offer some shorter offerings, um, some free offerings, and we also really wanted to spotlight our absolutely incredible team of people um, who are already facilitating with us, for us, who have been providing um, consultation to our, to our uh, trainees coming through again at all levels. Um, and, and also increasingly to our, our team of consultants and training as well, who are just um, so experienced and have so much to offer. And so this is really what we, what we wanted to offer, you know, tastes of what our various team members have um, to bring in this intersection between EMDR and perinatal mental health, brain spotting and perinatal mental health, um, special topics in this area um, acro across, as we know, it's, you know, such a wide and deep um, field. Um, so, so once uh, you'll see as, as these roll out that our topics are going to be wide ranging um, and you'll see the diversity of our team, um, which is part of what we're wanting you to see. Um, so you can uh, rely on us um, to support your professional development and just your professional selves as we build community with each other. How are we doing? Ah, okay. Sorry. That's okay. The technology is both wonderful and terrible, I find. <laughs> it just sometimes does not want to cooperate in the moments that we need it. Um, and what a great metaphor, really, for beginning our EMDR work, you know, Suna? Just thinking about this, you know, it's like, okay, we're all ready to go. We've got our, got our structure here. And then something from left field shows up and you know we're faced with sort of how to how to handle it um so we are just oh. working hard here ah, i'm yeah? thinking maybe we could just do this without the slides i can't seem to um it won't pop up huh even in the email it's not showing up i'm not sure what i'm doing it's unbelievable um mm -hmm. If you send them to me, I can try to present them and see if, did we do this already or? Uh... Let's try sharing my entire screen maybe, and then maybe. pulling it up that way. Can you see my screen now? Aha, uh -huh. it's trying see. to. I switched the layout, but I'm not seeing the slides. Um, worst case, we can do what we did with Julie's because she had really beautiful slides that we weren't able to um, to navigate either, and we can share those with folks after. So um, anyone who wants to get those slides can drop um, drop their email in our DMs, and I'll make sure that those get out. Okay. So, so I'm so sorry. Five minutes before we started, the slides ah! were on the screen. <laughs> I know. They are really lovely. <laughs> they are lovely. They're lovely. I'm not even sure why I can't email them. That's the most bizarre part. I just, they're not even popping up for me to send in the mm -hmm. email. So maybe this okay. is why people don't use PowerPoint anymore. Um, so I'm gonna just go ahead and begin, but thank you for the introduction, Mara. I apologize for the tech issues. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Suna Clinchard. Uh, like Mara said, I'm an approved consultant. And as I began to say earlier, I, um, came up with the idea for this tea with Touchstone, um, really because I was getting a lot of questions from consultees with not knowing how to begin, right? So you have your training, um, you've completed parts one and part two of your training, but you're not quite sure how to weave this into your practice. So 
Um, hopefully I'll share the slides with you after, but I'll just go through and, and share a few tips that I thought might be helpful. So first and foremost, you know, I think of how do I begin as almost the double Dutch jump rope. Um, when I was a kid, we always did double Dutch jump rope at recess. And so you're kind of just waiting to hop in, right? Many people who are learning EMDR have been uh, professionals in their field for many years, right? When I learned EMDR, I had been a therapist already for 15 years practicing. And so to become a beginner again is not always easy. It can be very challenging um, to kind of see through a new lens. So first and foremost, I just want to remind everyone, becoming an EMDR therapist is a developmental process, okay? So it takes practice. It takes a lot of consultation. Um, it takes being an ongoing, continuous learner, right? So foundational training or basic training, parts one and two of your training program will give you the gist of all eight phases, but we keep need to, or we need to keep circling back around and learning in a, in a deeper way and learning as we practice so that we can really apply, um, you know, what it means to use all eight phases of this work. So a friend once shared with me the analogy of a cup of coffee, right, in terms of the developmental process of, you know, really becoming comfortable with using EMDR throughout your practice. So, um, you know, at first, maybe when you learn, when you learn uh, EMDR, you know, you have your cup of black coffee and black coffee maybe represents how you've always done therapy and you pour in some cream and it's very distinct And my slide here has a nice little image of this. Um, but the cream is very distinct and you could see, oh, this is a case where I'd like to use EMDR or maybe I could apply EMDR for this trauma, right? But over time, as we become more comfortable with seeing through the AIP lens and, and comfortable with weaving um, this work into, you know, a variety of cases, the cream and the black coffee kind of, you know, blend together so that we are no longer just doing EMDR some of the times, but really, you know, really folding it into our work. Um, <clears throat> so my first tip, and, and, and I'll just say this real quick, nothing I'm going to talk about today is brand new. Um, these are all ideas that you've heard before if you've completed basic or foundational training, but this is just looping around and, and taking it, um, or maybe maybe helping you to, to kind of see in a more simple way how to start to weave it in with your practice. So my first tip is challenge yourself to really see through the lens of AIP. So AIP is adaptive information processing, right? If you're not really sure about what AIP means, I challenge you to go back and read chapter two in the Francine Shapiro text. Um, I challenge you to go back and reread the pages on AIP in your part one of your manual. Uh, there's a really great podcast uh, from Notice That that's all about AIP that I've listened to several times and I find very helpful. But really understanding AIP is the basis of being able to explain AIP to your clients. Um, and, and I think it's it's the modality that we're working on here, right? So a lot of folks I think get you know, super focused on how to explain the method of EMDR therapy to your clients, you know, understanding the neurobiology and understanding what it means to, um, you know, use the bilateral simulation and why we do that. And that's certainly important, but really helping clients to understand AIP is, is, is to me almost more important, right? So in real general terms, um, you know, an explanation that I would have with clients sounds something like this. You know, your brain has a natural capacity for healing and your brain has a tendency for metabolizing our life experience, you know, taking it in, digesting it, storing away in our adaptive memory networks what we need to, and then kind of flushing through what we no longer, um, you know, need to hold on to. And so there are a ton of metaphors, analogies that, that we use to to teach that to clients, um, 
you know, and I encourage you to, ha to have a lot of them on hand because depending on the client in front of you, you might want to pull from some different metaphors. The digestive system is a nice, easy metaphor that I fall back on often, right? So we're taking in, you know, food. Our body has this natural capacity to digest, break down. We store in the form of nutrition what we need and kind of flush through. And then, you know, the, the, the comparison here is when, when we're um, thinking of AIP, you know, it's like in the digestive system, you just swallowed a bone, right? So there's something stuck. So that's the second part of, of AIP um, that's important to teach and also to really understand is that, you know, we're looking at um, trauma as causing a disruption of this normal adaptive information processing, right? And so that allows us to see that symptomology is not necessarily you know, a psychological flaw, but an indication that there's some stuck or maladaptively linked or stored material, right? Which then leads to the past showing up as the present. So explaining this to your clients, that we have this natural capacity for healing, but that sometimes when we experience, you know, stress or trauma, this natural capacity gets, you know, disrupted, right? So there might be some stuck or lodged material. And that, that gives us almost a, a, a plan on what we can do in our, in our work together, right? So phase one, we're kind of identifying what is some of the stuck material. Um, and so that eventually when, when your client's ready for reprocessing phases, we can help to kind of clear that through. So big picture, seeing through the lens of AIP, even if you haven't taught your clients tapping, or even if you're not even, you know, anywhere near phases three through seven with your clients, you can start to see through the lens of AIP, start to see their symptoms, you know, as an indication that there might be some maladaptively um, linked or stuck material. And so the next slide <clears throat> is really about you know, also listening, right? So even without starting yet in reprocessing phases, we can be listening for themes, um, even on an intake session, you know, listening for themes in the narrative, um, fine tuning your ear to really hear and begin to <clears throat> kind of tease out some negative cognitions, even fine tuning your ear to hear positive cognitions. Um, so when clients are sharing, you know, their presenting issue and why they're coming in for therapy, we can even start to, to hear themes and be curious, right? And that can, and lead, that can lead you organically into the floatbacks, right? So um, I think sometimes newly trained EMDR therapists think that, you know, these phases are very rigid, where we, you know, like, okay, now we're starting into phase one. Let me get out my clipboard and ask you about the flowbacks, right? But if you can learn to start to hear the themes in the narrative, you know, be curious about the negative cognitions and what that means, you know, what self-referential beliefs, you know, go with the themes for the client, that can lead us into just very organically being curious about you know, when is the first time in your life that you believed I'm not enough, right? So kind of more of, of, of a conversation rather than something very, you know, rigid and distinct. <clears throat> so my next uh, tip is really being mindful of strengthening adaptive information. So also phase one, being curious about your client's coping skills, being curious about their, their strengths, being curious about, um, you know, positive qualities of themselves, being curious about exceptions or times when they do feel okay or good enough, right? Um, being curious about examples of resiliency. And so whenever clients share anything like that, that's, you know, remotely adaptive or feels like even a slight shift, um, you can invite them to slowly tap. So offering slow, short sets 
of bilateral stimulation, whether it's tapping or eye movements or, you know, holding a baby and slowly swaying side to side. <clears throat> the slow, short uh, sets of BLS can strengthen, help to expand, um, highlight any of that adaptive information. And so again, even when you haven't begun working with phases three through seven with your client, you can pause them in a dialogue when you notice them sharing something adaptive and invite them to, you know, slowly tap that in. And then pause and breathe. And what are you noticing now? And as they kind of start to shift and focus on that a little bit, be curious about where they feel it in their body, what emotions might go with it, what beliefs or thoughts might go with it. Okay. So again, just some ideas on, on how to kind of weave this in to your work, even when you're you're maybe still, you know, doing some talk therapy. So we talked a little bit about phase one in the sense of, um, you know, seeing through the lens of AIP and even teaching clients about AIP. We talked about listening for themes and even hearing negative cognitions or positive cognitions, um, strengthening adaptive information. And so my next slide is really about how our phase one work informs our phase two work. Okay, and so just a reminder here that resourcing is more than just uh, teaching exercises for affect regulation, right? And I think sometimes people come out of um, basic or foundational training thinking like, oh, these are the three resources we do. Phase two is calm place, phase two is container and light stream and then we move on, right? So for some clients that may suffice, but for many clients, especially those with more complex trauma, um, we're looking at our phase one information really guiding or informing our phase two work, okay? So um, more than just affect regulation, phase two can look like um, work that fills developmental gaps, meets attachment needs. Um, phase two can offer psychoeducation can build adaptive information really in any way, okay? So over time, you'll start to see that resourcing isn't just kind of the checkbox, but more of an individualized plan for each client based on their needs, okay? So phase one, we're identifying the needs and phase two, um, really, you know, doing what we can to fill those gaps and meet those needs before we move in um, to phases three through seven. So another question I often hear in uh, consultation is, how do I know where to begin with target selection? So I've done a float back and, you know, I've established a first, worst, most recent in terms of memories, but where do I begin? And some clients learn in training, depending on where, where they were trained, that you always start with the first. Or some clients are trained to, you know, always start with the presenting issue. And so <clears throat> my answer in consultation to this is in terms of where do I begin is it really depends, okay? So it's always a good idea to get good float back. So we're getting to know what's underneath the presenting issue. I specialize in perinatal work and I work with a lot of clients who um, come in with the presenting issue of some type of traumatic birth experience, right? Even though, you know, traumatic birth experience is, is one type of issue, the, the reasons or the negative cognitions that are beneath their experience vary so greatly, right? So I want to really understand why this experience for my client is so lit up and on fire. And oftentimes it's because there's rocket fuel beneath what they're showing up with, right? So being curious and identifying um, theme or negative cognition that goes with the presenting issue and then doing float backs and asking client for the first, worst, and most recent based on perhaps that negative cognition, um, you know, 
is super important. It gives me an idea of, of what's beneath or the rocket fuel, you know, that's behind the fire that they're coming in with. But once we get that, you know, we can make a clinical decision combined with um, our client's preferences, right, on where to begin. You know, sometimes it makes sense to start with um, a target that's maybe a little more mild. Some clients are, um, you know, a little skeptical about EMDR and not quite sure if this is for them or not quite sure if they, you know, really want to get into this quite yet. So maybe choosing a target that feels easier to move through seems like a good clinical decision. So maybe it's a first memory that's in the past and over, you know, something that happened on the playground when they were a kid that's, you know, just came up with them or came up for them in the float back. So where to begin is really a combination of your, um, you know, clinical reasoning combined with your client's preference. And so don't get too worried about this. Don't, you know, try and get the perfect target to begin with. Oftentimes, if I do a float back and get a first, worst, and most recent, and we choose to begin with one of them, the others come through in the midst of the processing anyhow, with regardless of what target we select. So the image I have here on this slide is an apple with a bite out of it. And my thought here is like, just get started. It's like turning the apple around and around and trying to make, you know, the decision of the perfect bite. As soon as you, you know, just get going systemically, things will kind of flush through. <clears throat> and then assume that processing continues in between sessions. And when your clients come back, be curious about that, you know, be curious about what's shifting and what they've noticed and what feels different. Okay, so getting started. Just if uh, I, I listed a few ideas here, um, just reminders, right? If you're struggling with um, getting started and it just feels clunky and there's so much, you know, paper in front of you and it feels like, you know, I don't, I have all these different pages that I have to flip through in my manual and, um, you know, my first suggestion is get organized. So review the manuals, have your script highlighted in front of you, or if you have it on an iPad or your laptop, have it up and ready to go so that you know exactly, you know, so that you know how to follow the script and read the script. If you're new to EMDR, there's no need to have this all memorized. You know, I still look at the script sometimes. Um, have a blank phase three worksheet in front of you. Remember phase three, um, the seven questions on the phase three worksheet, are there for you to use right before you begin with phases four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so phase three, um, the purpose of the worksheet is to light up or to activate the particular neural network that we're focusing on in the brain. And so you only want to use that right before you move into the reprocessing phases. Have a blank worksheet in front of you. Um, I keep a running list of all of my clients' resources. So I want to know, <clears throat> you know, I want to have in front of me, my client's calm place is the beach, their container is the box, um, their nurturing figure is their grandmother, <clears throat> maybe their protective figure is their dog. And so I want to have that in front of me. And sometimes I want to light that up a little bit before we begin with the reprocessing, right? And then you can also use resources like that as interweaves later if you need them. So it's important that you're familiar with what your client's resources are. Um, practice your explanation of AIP and EMDR. Record yourself saying it, write it out. You know, I do certification groups and our uh, second homework assignment is always to write out a detailed explanation of AIP and EMDR as you would describe it to your client. Um, and then it's, it's nice because everyone gets to hear everyone's explanation and you really build, um, you know, your options in terms of how to connect with different clients, right? Um, so practice your explanation until you feel comfortable and confident with it. <clears throat> Be sure to assess for dissociation. Get to know your client's nervous system. 
right? Before beginning with phases three through seven, um, assess for readiness and be sure your client has the ability to shift states with your prompting. Okay, so that goes back to the list of your client's resources. You know, be sure that you've practiced. You know, invite your clients to think of a mildly disturbing event or maybe they come in mildly disturbed and make sure you can practice offering them or prompting them to connect with their resources so that they can get back to grounding. Um, it's really important for me that the client has the ability to shift states before beginning with phases three through seven. Um, if they go outside their window of tolerance, I know how to help them you know, get back in, or if we have to stop with an incomplete session, I know how to help them get grounded before our session's over. And then another thought, if you're really still unsure about, you know, how to put this all together, practice with a colleague or a friend, you know, practice all eight phases until you start to feel a little more comfortable with the process. Just a few times of making it through all eight phases will usually, you know, build that confidence that you need to get started. Another idea is you can be selective on what clients you begin with. It might feel comfortable to start with a brand new client, right? Maybe someone who's just starting out with you and doesn't know you as the therapist that you were pre-EMDR. Or for some, it's more comfortable to start with someone that you have a, a strong, solid relationship with. Um, and you can be honest and say, you know, I'm learning I'm learning this new modality, right? So I might seem a little clunky at first, and I appreciate your patience, but, you know, choose the clients that you work with as a beginner, um, you know, intentionally. Also cases. So maybe it's best to start off with cases that are a little less complex, right? Um, you know, a colleague of mine always says you need to learn how to ride the bicycle before doing the BMX tricks, right? So start with cases that feel, you know, maybe single incident trauma or cases where clients had good enough early attachment experiences, you know, like minimal developmental trauma. It might be a little bit easier at first to get going. Um, you know, in, in less complex cases. Okay. And so my last slide is really about you as a therapist, your presence, um, your relationship with your client, your connection with your client, your attunement with your client is really the foundation of this work. Right, and I know that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle of the protocol, in um, you know the script, and and everything that feels a little, you know, clunky about EMDR when you're first learning. But my reminder to you is really that you can offer your presence and offer your clients a felt sense of connection and safety throughout all eight phases. Even in the reprocessing work where, you know, we know to keep our words to a minimum, just notice that, just go with that, we can still offer our presence and connection through our breath, through our eye contact, through our body language, through our empathy, nonverbal empathy, right? Um, even with, with the words, go with that or notice that, we can say, go with that and notice that in a million different ways that convey presence. So an empathetic, go with that, right? A cheerleader, go with that. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can show your clients that you're with them. And so finding your center first before you step into an EMDR session or before you step into any therapy session really enables you as a therapist to actually hold the space for your client, right? Hold the space for healing. Um, finding your center sharpens your clinical intuition, allows for you to really kind of sink into the process and trust in the process. So I encourage you 
especially if you're a beginner, um, you know, to really take a moment, take five minutes before the beginning of your practice or take a few moments at the beginning with your client and, and do some breath work and really find your center and, and just pay attention and notice to the difference that makes. <clears throat> So that's about it for the slides, and I apologize that you didn't get to see them, but I will share them uh, with the team. And so if you feel like you'd like to go back and look, but if you're interested, I do offer consultation groups for um, those who are trained with Touchstone or ICM, um, open consultation groups. And then I also run certification groups that are a six month series um, that are a closed group. I usually do a group of five and we go back and review all eight phases of EMDR and then go a little bit deeper into a case presentation and consultation. So feel free to reach out to me on my website if you are interested in connecting um, for consultation. But thank you for being here. <clears throat> I hope it was helpful and at this point, we will shift into questions. All right. Hi, Mara. Are you muted, Mara, or can I just not hear you? No, I'm muted. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> We'd be used to this already, right? Three years in, but no. Um, thank you, Suna. That was that was really great. That was really helpful. I particularly like the reminder um, that phase two resources can be used as interweaves when mm -hmm. needed, mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which phase one can guide phase two not mm -hmm. just target selection, but also resourcing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, Mara, I think a lot of folks um, come out of the basic training and it makes sense, right? Because mm -hmm. basic training, foundational training is very basic. So we want to give people right. enough to get going, <clears throat> right. right? But I think right. a lot of folks come out of basic training, you know, with a good understanding of phase two um, mm -hmm. being geared toward, you know, exercises to help with affect regulation, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, calm place, light stream, right? right? Exactly. And so, yes, that's important, right? Mm -hmm. Ability to shift states and, in, in, mm -hmm. you know, find yeah. grounding and calm. Yeah. But also, right, there's also, there are also other, um, there's, uh, there are more, you know, functions of our phase two work, yeah. right? Yeah. So identifying those gaps, right? Yeah. Gaps in in uh, their adaptive information, right? <clears throat> Maybe identifying attachment rupture and you mm -hmm. know utilizing phase two to meet those needs, mm -hmm. um, developmental trauma, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think I just want to I want to emphasize what you said about what we teach in foundational or basic training. Um, addresses really generally one category of uh, resourcing, which is the affect regulation sh uh, state shift uh -huh. piece, and that the other pieces um, that we can potentially address are more, you know, more elaborated than that. So I think that's exactly right. So we have some questions. Um, so Abby asks, uh, I had a client ask, when you say go with that, what am I going with? And is that a situation when notice that might be a helpful language shift? Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I feel like, uh, you know, when we're saying go with that or notice that, right, it's usually after a client's reporting, mm -hmm. you know, what came up for them throughout, throughout the last set, right? So what are you noticing now? I noticed this go with that, right? And so to me, and Mara, feel free to hop in here, but to me, go with that just means mm -hmm. keep going, right? Like allowing yeah. the processing mm -hmm. to continue in whatever direction it is. It's a prompt that means go on yeah. without necessarily, you know, stopping them or even as a therapist needing too much information, right? Yeah, exactly. 
And I think at the very beginning of uh, doing EMDR reprocessing with somebody, we have to teach them how we do this. And so it's a common early question, what am I noticing or what am I going with? And what you can say, what I will often say is, so this thing that you just noticed, you're going to start there and then from there you're going to go with go. And so what we're neurobiologically doing is saying, oh yeah, here's the channel. And then we let the brain do whatever the brain's going to do. Um, but I actually, both, I tend to say, I don't know about you, Suna, but I'll say, I'll flip-flop between go with that and notice that anyway. Because um, very, I very often have, don't have to say very much. So mm -hmm. It gives me a little variety anyway. Mm -hmm. um, good. Um, second question, Michelle asks, how do we know if someone is adequately resourced to move into phase three? and then reprocessing. Uh -huh. I have a client with limited resources, except those that I will teach. I wanna make sure she's well-resourced before starting reprocessing. Excellent, uh -huh. to, to do that. So how do you know? Uh -huh. It's a very good question, right? And so, um, no, you know, assessing for client readiness. You know, I mentioned this on one of the slides that you didn't see, but number one for me is knowing that client has the ability to shift states. So the affect regulation piece, right? Knowing that um, I have observed that in my practice or my office, knowing that they're reporting their ability to shift states with their own practice of some of these coping skills or grounding skills or resourcing skills mm -hmm. that we're working on in real life. Um, that to me is, is, you know, first and foremost, very important, right? It's also important, I think, that we get to know our client's nervous system, right? And get to know how they process, right? And often their phase one information gives us more insight into that, mm -hmm. right? So clients who perhaps have a, a higher trauma load or um, maybe more developmental or attachment trauma will have more, you know, the, the, the need for us to focus on the phase two work is greater, right? Mm -hmm. And so that kind of goes back to the conversation we just had, Mara, with the phase one yeah. um, information really informing us on mm -hmm. the work we need to do in phase two. Yeah, because it gives us a peek into where there may be deficits or, or injuries in the, in the store of adaptive information that they walked in the door with, mm -hmm. particularly when there's been early trauma and I think also when there's perinatal trauma, you know, there's stuff that families are faced with that they would have had no opportunity to learn. Um, but yeah, the state shift is so important um, to be able to maintain dual attention, which is what we want. Yeah. Good. Other questions? Anything else, anybody? You know, the those months after, and years sometimes really, after um, but that initial training, you know, there's a lot that people trip over and realize like, wait a minute, I know we learned this, but I can't remember because it takes so much repetition um, and review uh, to, to get through stuff. And so, you know, I think these tips are fantastic and they're grounding. One of the things that's really nice is that they're orienting and they're grounding. And I think it's so important when you're beginning to remember that, you know, this process is complex, but it's also straightforward in some ways. Ah, we have another question. Uh, Robin, hi, hey Robin. Robin has um, a question. Do you have tips for working with clients when the trauma is ongoing, like mm -hmm. a sick child with medical procedures? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, something that comes up for me with your question, Robin, is oftentimes when the trauma is ongoing, we need to look at the positive cognition and maybe add some modifiers onto it, right? So that it's applicable for right now, right? If I'm reading your question with a, a sick child, ongoing sickness with medical procedures. Um, so, you know, when you're identifying a PC that goes with that, it might be something like, I'm doing the best I can 
each day or right mm -hmm. now, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm okay now, right? Um, you know, other, other thoughts with that, you really have options in terms of target selection when the, when the trauma is ongoing and the work can be very powerful, right? So, um, you know, looking at helping parents with a sick child to be able to stand it, right? Often we hear that NC come through, like, I can't stand it, right? But helping them to be present and be with their children as they're going through, you know, a medical procedure or the next doctor's mm -hmm. appointment or the next, you know, injection or whatever that may be, right? Um, so we can do obviously work on past traumas, but we can also do um, future prong targets with upcoming, you know, medical um, procedures mm -hmm. or appointments. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, and you know, one, one small tidbit to just jump on what you've said here, Suna, which I agree with, is, you know, especially when there's uncertainty, uh -huh. just helping people to stay with what they know right now. Uh -huh. What do you think? As a resource, the, even when right now sucks, you know, it's a, uh, what we don't know what's going to happen next week is, you know, often yeah. more monstrous in the imagination. So some of those beliefs, like, you know, I'm here now, I'm doing yeah. the best I can. Yes. You yes. know, yes. we're getting through this or, yes. you know, a little more gentle on our, right. on ourselves right. and our expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Very gentle <clears throat> and small, very small bites too. Uh -huh. But it's amazing the how powerful this work can be um, with clients. I mean, I think of, you know, like parents from parents who had babies in the NICU, right? And they're still caring for medically fragile babies at home after the fact, right? Yeah. It's so powerful to be able to go back and do some of the work, you know, with targets of, you know, the the birth experience or the NICU experience mm -hmm. and can help them to be more present in the here and the now and can help, you know, to alleviate um, that hypervigilance and that intensity and the anxiety that can, you know, follow yeah. those experiences. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. It looks like there's another question. Oh, there's really some comments. Oh. Um, this is, Amy says, this has reminded me that I have what I need mm. to just get started. Yay. But that's, that's the big thing right there is, is stepping forward and getting started. So great. That's and you good. know, I love that, Amy. Thank you for saying that. Um, I got a little nervous with the slide debacle at the beginning. So, oh, sorry. And my screen went funny. Um, so thank you for, for that. That's encouraging to hear. But also, you know, just as we remind parents in the perinatal work that good enough is good enough, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you to Winnicott. Um, I remind you as newly trained EMDR therapists that good enough is good enough, right? There isn't a perfect resource. There isn't a perfect time of where to hop into phases three through seven. There's not a perfect target to begin with. And guess what? Use your attunement and your connection with your client to let them know that they're safe with you and that you're with them and that they have a stop signal if they need it and that you're connected enough to know, you know, that they're still within their window of tolerance and you're, you're guiding them through it. You're holding the space for them, right? And, you know, good enough is good enough as a beginner at, at, at any level, right? But just get going, get your feet wet, you know, dip your toe in with, you know, challenge yourself, you know, every day or every week to stretch mm -hmm. it a little bit further, maybe with one additional client or to kind of add something, another resource practice that you've never done before. You know, mm -hmm. there are so many great, um, you know, resources, podcasts and books mm -hmm. and trainings that are available, you know, so what you, what you've learned now with foundational training phases one through eight, for standard protocol, that's it. You know all that you need to know to get started. Everything else is just adding, 
you know, meat on the bones of what you already know. So get good consultation. We have such a great team at Touchstone, um, consultants who have such a variety of specialties, specialty in um, neurodivergence, specialty in um, OCD, perinatal OCD, you know, specialty in, um, we have, we have consultees who run BIPOC specific consultation groups that are awesome. So, you know, whatever it is that you need, I encourage you to look on the Touchstone consultation listing and see, um, you know, if there's someone there that matches your needs. So we're happy to help you. I mean, everyone on our team is super passionate about, you know, helping you to develop as an EMDR therapist. And, you know, it takes time and, Mm -hmm. Day by day, you know, just keep learning, keep challenging yourself. And Mara, you have some some trainings coming up too that I we wonder. We do and we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep coming to the Touchstone Training, Touchstone Institute training um, page on our website. We have a, a trainings that are uh, opening up very soon for the fall. We have um, Deb Rich is going to be giving, um, holding some of her pregnancy loss and infant death uh, trainings at the end of July. Uh, Robin Shapiro and I are doing a three-day training on ego state approaches for perinatal mental health, which I think is going to be incredibly fun and I think really, really useful as we really talk about some of these really specific situations. Um, Debbie Davis and I have are gonna be holding our bereavement workshop, Empty Cradle Broken Heart, and also our Nikki workshop in the fall. And we have some of our faculty and, um, you know, our team offering some really cool trainings upcoming. We're going to have an early trauma protocol training, the Katie O'Shea and Sandra Paulson training. That's the early trauma protocol. We're going to have a training on um, dealing with anger in the perinatal period from um, Patrick, one of our facilitators, Patrick Manette. We have, um, we have one coming up on chronic illness. We have just, uh, and Suna, um, you have one. We do. You know, so, the schedule. I was thinking yeah. the best for last. Tell oh. us how you do that um, on Great. Yes. Looking forward to it. Heidi, Rosal, and I are, are hosting a training in October, hopefully, uh, mm -hmm. this Late year. Late October, maybe so early November, but that time October, of year. October, November. Um, so keep your eye out. It hasn't been posted yet, but we're, we're doing a resourcing workshop. So um, resourcing uh, specific to perinatal work. So really going in, you know, taking a deeper dive into resourcing you know, more about that idea of our phase one work informing our phase two work and, and really um, it, there'll be an opportunity hopefully for some practicum in there too. So. Well, I'm super excited that, this is, that. this is going to be on the calendar because Suna can tell you that I've been like following her around saying, you ready to schedule it? You ready to schedule it? <laughs> because I just think that this, you know, this deepening of the richness of phase two work, Suna, is so important and you and Heidi are just among the best people that I can think of too. To teach it. Oh, thank so you. I'm super excited. Um, again, th thank you so much, Suna, and thank you for for inaugurating our new streaming platform. We are, as you all know, out there new to the live stream, and we thank you all for sticking around as we navigate this new technology within the old technology. And Suna, um, you know, thank you for your for your passion and your content and your expertise and your warmth. I think. Anybody who consults with you is really, really fortunate. Um, Thank you, Mara. And thanks so much for having me. You know, even though the slides didn't work out, it was still an honor to be here. And we will get those and, slides. Yeah. Yeah. And thank, thank you, you all, all for being, being here. here. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Have a good night. Or it's night here. Have a good day. <laughs> you know, I'm in a different time zone. Enjoy your tea. <laughs> yeah, enjoy your tea. <laughs>